I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. That bloke looks a bit miserable, doesn't he? I'm not surprised he's been under that shower for over 130 years. This is Carlton Gardens, where the people of Melbourne had their wine shows and food shows and auto shows and expos and sexpos. Now, you may see a magnificent piece of corporate landscaping, but what I see is a huge pile of foul, stinking dung. You coming or what? <laughs> Walking through the Melbourne suburb of Carlton. It's one of the city's most diverse pockets, which could explain some trigger happy trade unionists, blam, 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 blam. a 19th century scientific scandal, basically a slimy bottom dweller, <laughs> and a very naughty street protest. We may well be busted. No, oh, oh you troublemaker. <laughs> First, let's talk dung. In the early days of Melbourne, what's now Carlton Gardens was a wilderness where the townspeople could go for a ramble with lots of tall grass and native trees and marsupials hopping about. But as it grew because of the gold rush, they started to have a waste problem. What to do with the damn stuff? So a pile of poo landed up here, and then another one over here, and then another one, and another one, until the whole place was one fetid mass. In fact, a local journalist said that if you wanted to enjoy the fountain, then you had to walk through circles of smell that were so foul, it was like the darkness that descended on Egypt in biblical times. It's probably worth the walk, though. If the fountain was anything like that one, it would have been quite a treat, wouldn't it? You see all those cute little platypuses there? Our first stop today is that grand old lady right behind the fountain. In the golden age of international exhibitions in the 19th century, the exhibition building was Melbourne's way of saying to the rest of the world, oh, oh, look at me, look at me. And to this day, people still do. Although, to be honest, if you want to explore a place like this, don't go in the swanky doors. Sneak round, come here, sneak round somewhere like this. The bowels of the building are home to Melbourne Museum's paleontology collection. I could look at some old bones and fossils, but I prefer to dig up some scientific dirt. Rob, 150 years ago, this was a sea of spite, wasn't it? It certainly was. There was a huge fight going on between two characters, Wilhelm Bondowski, the uh, uh, government zoologist, and Frederick McCoy, who was already director of the museum. Blandowski, an ambitious Darwinist, coveted McCoy's job. But McCoy, a committed creationist, had powerful allies within the Royal Society. So Blandowski resorted to scientific name-calling. So how do these fish fit into the story? Well, Blandowski went to the River Murray-Darling and he identified, uh, amongst other things, uh, 19 fish, and he named them after members of the Royal Society. And they were impressed with that. They weren't too happy when they started to read the descriptions of the fish, however. What kind of descriptions were they? Well, this one here, who he named after the current president, Blisdale, he described it as living in the mud at the bottom of the river, and that was interpreted as describing the president as basically a slimy bottom dweller. <laughs> the mayor of Melbourne, Richard Eads, also copped a serve. His namesake fish was low-browed, big-gutted and spiny. 
But when Blandowski published his scientific paper, the Royal Society had the last laugh. And this uh, volume here shows what the council decided to do. This Which note here. Page 131 to 134, inclusive, with four plates, are omitted from this volume of the transactions by an order of the council. They censored his work. They censored his work. This was scientific censorship, and this was to avoid their embarrassment at the descriptions of the fish. Landowski's career was effectively finished. All thanks to a couple of ugly fish. What I really find sad is that though McCoy had this glittering career, Blandowski ended up dying insane in a mental institution. Still, on, on, on. Hmm, dung-filled parks, bowels of buildings and slimy bottom dwellers. I think it's time to raise the tone of this walk. Considering it's perched right on the edge of the business district, Carlton has oodles of old world charm. This is Drummond Street, which is pretty typical of Carlton streets in many ways, although in some ways it isn't. Look at all this lovely green sward and the big trees and the width of the street. Well, there is a reason for that. At this house, 135, lived a bloke called Patrick Costello, who was a member of the Legislative Assembly, a pretty corrupt one, and at an apparently convivial and boozy meeting of the council, he managed to persuade the councillors to widen and beautify his street. And if you're wondering about the surname of that dodgy politician, Costello, he was actually the great-great-grandfather of the federal treasurer in the Howard years, Peter Costello who, of course, wasn't a dodgy politician. Fortunately, the Pollies, dodgy or otherwise, have made sure that much of Carlton's 19th century charm hasn't been lost. Which is a good thing. Mostly. Pretty little terrace there, pretty terrace there, pretty terrace there. Vulgar lump of huge monstrosity there. It is quite disgusting, isn't it? It's called Benvenuta, and it was built by a family of gun makers and arms dealers who made their fortune selling their weapons on the gold fields. It's got to be, what, 15 tonnes of marble and all these little curly bits? I don't want to be a snob, but it's new money, isn't it? No taste, no style. Unlike your modern-day arms dealers. By the way, you know that Melbourne saying about four seasons in one day? Well, it's true. I was going to go straight up there to Ligon Street for coffee and creamy cakes, but I noticed that, which, if you don't know, is the eight-hour memorial, because Melbourne was the first place in the world to achieve an eight-hour day for its working people. Eight hours work, eight hours leisure, and eight hours rest, as you can see the fight is still going on. This building is the Trades Hall, and this is the kind of Carlton history that really interests me, I have to say. Um, I think we might as well go into the Trades Hall. I don't even know if we've got permission to do this, but um, what are they going to do? Throw us out at worst, and at least I can get dry and the camera can dry off too. This is a far cry from all the elaborate scroll work of Benvenuta, isn't it? Look at this. All the names of the people who were involved in trying to get better rights for working people. All their names recorded in this beautiful golden scroll work. You can imagine them all pacing up and down in their cloth caps, their dark coats, their lots and lots of facial hair, of course. And yes, when you get to the big stairway, this is a tribute to the pioneers of the eight-hour day. See how many of them were Masons? James Dalgetty, Jephthah Freeman. There were so many Masons involved in that particular struggle. They were turbulent times for these working-class warriors. Fighting for political and social equality, we take for granted. But some Union battles weren't quite so noble.
In the year 1916, there was a big row about whether or not a ballot was being conducted appropriately or inappropriately, and the firearms went off, excuse me, guys. Blam, 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 blam. They were going, people ducking, and the bullet holes buried themselves, apparently, into the walls. That could be one, couldn't it? Just there, can you see that? I mean, that might just be a hole where someone pinned up a poster, but we're going to say it's a bullet hole. Blam, blam, blam. Unfortunately, it's still raining, but I'm afraid I can't resist the siren song of Ligon Street any longer. There you are. This is interesting. That contraption there was the very first modern espresso machine ever imported into Australia. So that was the beginning of all that. And all this was the start of a cafe culture that spread right across Australia. In a way, Ligon Street is like a snapshot from history because it was originally created long ago by Italians when they were servicing a really vibrant immigrant community, which has gone long ago. Now the customers who come here are the middle classes from the city. And this is like a, a cosmopolitan catering Disneyland. Does that sound a bit sniffy? It's not really meant to be. I'd eat here every night if I could. Not that my waistline or my wife would let me. Anyway, let's move on. I always think that when you're walking through a town, you want to keep looking up because that's where the gold nuggets are. And that is the perfect example. Beautiful old neon sign, Basari's Corner. That's Nino Basari. You're a Nino Basari, aren't you? But that was your dad. That was my father, exactly. What's the story behind that sign? Well, it's a fascinating story. Dad was an Olympic gold medalist and uh, won a, a gold medal in the 1932 Olympics for Italy, not Australia. And he was contracted to come out in 1938 by the Victorian government to the centenary bike race. And when the war broke out, he was stuck here. He'd been given a key to the city. They, they, they couldn't intern him, but they couldn't let him go. Stuck as a professional cyclist, he only had one thing he could do. He could ride bikes and repair them. Some of his fans loaned him some money, and he started up Bosaris. It is quite extraordinary, isn't it, that there was your dad, an enemy in an alien country, and they let him set up a shop, and he didn't have a problem. Yeah, well, to his great pride, and I think to all Australians, not a single rock was ever thrown through his window during the war, even though it was operated by an enemy alien, technically, at that time. From enemy alien, it was a short trip to unofficial royalty. After the war, Nino Basari's popularity earned him the title of the King of Carlton. This is the present-day Basari bike shop. As you can see, the bikes here are a far cry from the ones that Nino would have been selling in the 1950s. This is the perfect example. It's made of aluminium and wood. It was imported from Italy just after the war. And um, I was planning to ride off on it, but quite frankly, this saddle is disappearing so far up my bum that uh, I think I'm just going to leave it there and walk off. So when I said Carlton, I bet you didn't think slanderous fish, kitsch arms dealers and alien cyclists. Come to think of it, why would you? Anyway, the sun's out again, and I'm going shopping where the locals hang out. Could I have that plate of prosciutto as well? So much gorgeous stuff here. Thanks. A lot of the Italian food has been in the Australian culture for a long time. I thought that most Italians had arrived here around about the time of the Second World War, like the guys in the bike shop. But in fact, there have been Italians in Carlton for much longer. Thank you. Some people have been shopping here for quite a long time. Gloria, how old do you reckon you were when you first came into this shop? I'd say approximately five. And five how old are you now? 89. Congratulations. How long have your family been in this country? Uh, I'd say approximately since 1890. They came over poverty-stricken, but they, at heart they were musicians. 
long before buskers needed licenses, Gloria's forebears proudly plied their trade on the streets of Carlton, playing the Viginese folk songs at their southern Italian home. Music that can still be heard today. This is Dorrit Street, where a lot of Gloria's childhood memories took place. And you hear that? Does that remind you it's of when you were a little girl? It certainly does. This is music of the old country, isn't it? My word. Close your eyes and listen to that. I can almost imagine myself back there with Gloria and her family, sharing a rough red, some local produce, and listening to the folk music her great-grandparents listened to. It's a trip to another time and another culture. Carlton will do that to you. There's another story about this house which involves completely different people in very dark circumstances. It's 1949. This woman, a prostitute called Jean Lee, and her two accomplices try to rob a drunk bookmaker when things go horribly wrong. Jean was on the sofa with the bloke and she was trying to get the money out of his pocket and couldn't because he was so fat and the blokes burst in and there was some kind of argument and they started bashing him and then the fight turned into systematic torture and Jean glassed the bloke in the face and he eventually died. Jean and her accomplices were caught, convicted and then hanged in 1951. But the times were a-changing in Australia. People started thinking, by hanging a woman, are we doing something which really doesn't reflect very well on the psyche of Australia? And in fact, she became the last woman ever to be executed in Australia. So even though it's a horrible story right in this room, something quite good came out of it. Thank you, Tony, it's for truly having me. glorious. Thank you. Thanks for the Italian kiss. <laughs> Bye, guys. See ya. Bye. Bye. With my savage breast suitably soothed, it's time to fire it up again. I'm off to nearby Faraday Street for some alternative theatre, 60s style. Oh, the glitter of showbiz is so alluring, isn't it? 42nd Street, Shaftesbury Avenue, Sydney Opera House. This little alleyway might not be quite so romantic, but it does lead to a Carlton icon, one of the most influential and indeed one of the smallest theatres in Australia, La Mama. That light doesn't seem to be on, so... Uh... Seats. Not the most cost effective form of theatre, but fantastic performance space. Two words describe La Mama's style guard and avant. Not necessarily in that order. These actors are improvising on the theme of melancholy, but their 1969 counterparts preferred a very public challenge to Australia's legal and social landscape. One of the great things about such a tiny theatre is that every available bit of space needs to be used. So even this courtyard, it's not just where the bar and the catering take place, but it's a theatrical space too. Bill, there's one legendary day, isn't there, in the history of La Mama, that the events took place right here, and it wasn't just a play, but it was a real theatrical event. It was using theatre to tackle the censorship situation in Australia head on at that time. You've got to understand that in the late 60s, censorship was so tight in Australia that when you came into the country, customs searched your bags not for drugs but for books. And just a few months before the events that took place here, um, Graham Blundell, who was a director here in the theatre, 
His house was raided at 6 o'clock in the morning by the Vice Squad, whose job it was to check on theatrical performances and so on, and his bookcases were searched for filthy drama scripts and so on. So John Romerall, a playwright, decided that we should take on the authorities uh, in public, and so he wrote a play called Whatever Happened to Realism, and it was staged here. It was a racy little piece which climaxed with actors shouting obscenities being arrested by other actors playing Vice Squad cops. Just as they were doing that, the real Vice Squad detectives also rose up out of the audience, followed them up and arrested everybody. So they may have just have been coppers, but they had an impeccable sense of timing. They did, <laughs> yes. And what happened next? Ah, well, you see, they had to do something with them, having arrested them, so they decided to take them to the local police station. We have at least a dozen actors in there. I'll see if I can get them to, to recreate that day. Fingers crossed. Hello? <laughs> Right, we've got our volunteers. Out you come, mm. everyone. And it was here that the actual performance took place. That's right, the stage was here. The audience was right along the car park here, back into the street, about 150 people. 150? Yeah, because yeah. you'd only have got 35 yeah, in that's there, right. wouldn't you? Yeah. So did, did they deliberately have the performance out here? Absolutely. It was necessary for the obscenities to be uttered in a public place where you were committing an offence. And, and what were the obscenities? <laughs> Bugger off, will you? Did you get that? Yeah. All right, let's, let's rehearse that. One, two, three, and... Bugger off, will ya? One more. Bugger off, will ya? OK, that's brilliant. OK, so we'll be the actors, all right, Bill? Okay. And, and, and you are the irate audience uh, as we're being dragged off. Yeah. Yeah. We're being dragged off to the police station. And you... Bugger off, will ya? Bugger off, will ya? So what were the lines from the play the irate audience was shouting? I'll tell you. Probably not John Romerill's finest work, but it was certainly pithy. Eventually, everyone arrived at the local police station and the actors were taken in to be charged. Thank you very much. That was very impressive. Take five. Take five. Oh, you troublemaker. <laughs> this is actually the police station that the demonstration arrived at. That's it. That's the place. And inside, the police sergeant is saying, bring some squad cars in, but don't use sirens. We're surrounded by an audience here. <laughs> We're surrounded by an audience. What hell that must have been That's for them. Right. And what happened? Well, they were charged and across the road they were put on trial before the magistrate. In that courthouse? In that courthouse right there. And uh, the first case was dismissed and the rest of them, then nothing happened. And so that was it. So was it really a storm in a teacup? No, oh, not at all. It was the beginning of the end for that sort of uh, censorship of the theatre in Australia, together with actions that were taking place in other theatres around the country. This was, this was the end of the Vice Squad sitting in, in the theatre waiting to be offended. But the double irony is that a law has just been reenacted in Victoria, hasn't it, which says you're not allowed to swear in the street. So actually what we've been doing has been as illegal as what they were doing all those years ago. That's right. So, if we just stay here, we may well be busted. If there are still any police around. <laughs> Seems like we're okay. <laughs> Whew, that was a close call. <laughs> Bye. So that's Carlton. Socially, culturally, and politically, I think we've covered a lot of grounds, don't you? But it's been one of our shortest walks. So, if you don't mind, I might squeeze in one more stop. It's a secret. No signs on the door, nothing. What could it be? Yeah. Hey, up, gentlemen. Uh, Is this table private? Oh, can anyone join us? Join us. <laughs> Thank you. It's a word-of-mouth private restaurant, a popular haunt for long-time Carltonites, like John Timlin, Max Gillies, and John Romerill. Yes, that playwright. Do you think that in those days living in Carlton gave you quite an identity? Oh, well, yeah. Well, people say, where, where do you live? If you went to Sydney, mm. I'd say, you wouldn't say Melbourne, you'd say I live in Carlton. Mm -hmm. So it had a certain cachet, and I think that was probably connected both with the universities and, and 
and the theatre. OK, I know where Carlton's been, but where's it going to go? So where do you think Carlton might be heading in the next 10 to 20 years? Um, I think it'll be business as usual. Mm -hmm. There's a fabulous mix of, of, of people. A lot yeah. of artists live here. Intelligentsia sort of industries, design, uh, all that stuff, There's, it's got great virtues. Yeah, exactly. It's still a very culturally vibrant place. And you know, I think this would continue to be a, a place for creative, stimulating, intellectual, social life as a, as a matter of course. Something tells me if I don't get out now, I never will. <laughs> I've really enjoyed the Carlton that I've seen on my walk, and I'm really pleased that the flag bearers of the old Carlton aren't turning their noses up at the present day one, but think that with a fair wind, it'll continue to grow and prosper as a multicultural, slightly alternative place. And having said that, you'd now expect me at the end of the program probably to walk off towards the horizon looking thoughtful and slightly inspired. But I'm not going to. I'm going to go back in there, have another drink with the lads. Mm -hmm.